Now for me, the number one factor when it comes to successful carp fishing, or any fishing for that matter, is location. And equal most important is casting. Now, I guess we can all cast, but there's a difference between casting as, as just a way of getting the rig in the water and casting in a way that isn't gonna spook the fish that you've tried so hard to find in the first place. Okay, so it's time to make a cast. We know where the fish are. We've seen fish feeding 30 to 40 yards. We've seen the big and bosh out. That's it, we can't wait. Let's get a rig in. So, if this takes one cast, then that's great. If this takes two or three to get it right, it's kind of game over, really. So, what I would do, I would line my left foot in line with where I've seen the fish feeding. Line my left foot up, my rod's in, the hip, in my hip, and that's also lined up to where the fish are feeding. Now, my body is shaped to cast to that spot, so I could pretty much do this with my eyes closed, the rig will go there. What I see a lot of people do is, is start from behind, um, and then the lead is swinging side to side. Doesn't matter how hard you try and keep it still, a lot of people are lined up like this for ages and ages, and I can feel that lead swinging behind me even though I'm trying to keep it dead still. So even when you bring the rod forward, it can have a tendency to veer off ever so slightly left or right. So I'd line my left foot up, if I'm right, if you're right-handed, rod in the hip, and that's where the lead's gonna go. So all I need to do now is just bring the rod back pull with my left hand and then control the line, feather it, stop it, slow it down. And when that lead entered the water, I'd slowed it right down. So it's practically barely traveling when it was just a foot, 18 inches above the water and then stop it. Um, by stopping it so close to the water, it's just making a slight plop, a bit like, I mean, that's a four ounce lead and that probably made the sound of like someone just flicking in a marble. If I wasn't to, to slow it down and stop it and the lead was to go in on its own accord, it would be traveling at full speed, going in the water really, really fast. Um, not only is it making lots of noise, it's sending lots of vibrations through the swim, which the carp can detect. And it's just, it's either spooked them out the area entirely or seriously put them on edge, which is gonna make them feed less confidently and harder to catch. So having made your perfect stealthy cast, the important part now is having an understanding of what you are fishing over by feeling the lead down to the lake bed. So what you're effectively trying to do is the same as if we were lowering the rod straight down off the tip in the margins, feeling, feeling the lake bed. So on a tight line, lowering the rod, sort of feeling, basically using the rod as an extension of your hands to feel around on the lake bed. Now, if you were to lower the rod too fast, line goes slack, you can't keep up with the lead and you, you don't feel anything. If you're to lower it too slow, then the lead just kind of gradually comes to rest and again, you, you're not really getting a, an understanding of what the lake bed's like. Now, I, I've, I have seen quite a few people, when they've cast out and they stop the line, just before it hits the water, they kind of hold the rod like that. That's not actually feeling the lead down. What you'll feel there is the lead swinging in on an arc and gradually coming to rest on the lake bed. So it's not actually feeling it down. You're getting a sensation being relayed back to the, to the rod, but you're not really feeling it down as such. So effectively, when we cast out, if when you stop the, stop the uh, line, the rod's almost at a 90 degree position, and you can then follow the lead down through the water column. So just like we're doing in the margins, following it down, following that lead down, a lake bed. So let's do that now out there. So again, line up in the hip there. Feather control it, stop it there and feel that lead down. So in this situation we're fishing on silt and you can feel it, it feels soft, you just feel the, the lead coming to rest on the lake bed. If we're fishing over on gravel you feel it really bang down. Uh, same if you're fishing on, uh, on clay, 
And again, if you're fishing in weed, it'll be a very dull down sensation, similar to silt, but it's hard to explain the difference. But again, by fishing different waters and feeling that lead down, you will be able to tell the difference and, and build up a, a better understanding. Now, one of the most common mistakes I see people doing, and it's perhaps one of the first things I was taught uh, when I started fishing as a boy, and that's just to be quiet. <laughs> um, the amount of disturbance I see on the bank side and people maybe he's blaming rigs and baits and that for their lack of success. And it, it's been down to the fact that it's so noisy. Um, I mean, as soon as I see a, a bivy mallet coming into play, I think, well, that's, that's knackered it for not just them, but everyone in the, in the immediate vicinity. Um, I mean, carp have a lateral line, which is, which is what they use to detect vibrations and sound travels, vibrations travel and once you start in malleting around, any fish that were in the area are either gone or very much on edge. Um, it isn't just mallets though, there's, there's other things that can be done to help tone down the noise. Um, not setting up right by the water's edge if it's possible, set back away from the water's edge. Also, we can go back to casting. Every cast you make in the swim is, is put in disturbance on the swim unnecessarily and although we obviously return the fish unharmed and alive we are still effectively hunting hunting a wild animal and if we were after another species for like like a deer for example you wouldn't just sort of go walking into the into the woods throwing bricks around and just shooting wildly into the woods which is effectively what you are doing by just casting around all over the swim now I know I've touched upon casting so many times already, but one other thing I see so many people doing, experienced anglers included in this, is when they are retrieving their lead, allowing it to bounce and skip all the way along the surface, thus just creating more disturbance. Um, I would keep the rod down low, just above the water, and reel in so the lead's high in the water, it's not bouncing and skipping and splashing all over the place, then last minute just swing it to hand. Now another mistake I see people doing is just quite simply overcomplicating things, um, especially when it comes to rigs. Uh, I look in the tackle box and they may have a dozen or more different rigs all tied up uh, with different components and it, it confuses me to look at it so I, I can see how it can be confusing. For me, I just use two rigs, not including zig rigs or anything like that, but I just use two rigs um, and they both cover a multitude of different fishing situations. I fish my version of the hinge stiff rig, which is what I use for fishing in weed or over debris. Then I use a blowback rig, which covers pretty much everything else. Um, now, the components may change slightly, but the fundamentals always remain the same. Um, I would fish it, it can either be used for, for pop-ups or bottom baits. Um, basically, the, the pop-up version is just the same as the bottom bait version, except it has some putty or a split shot to counterbalance the, the pop-up. If I was fishing uh, PVA bags, then the rig would just be shortened and, and a braid used instead of a, a coated braid. Um, if I was fishing maggots, again, it would just have exactly the same principles, but it'll have a little piece of cork on the, the hair. So that, that rig itself covers pretty much everything. And although the components may have changed over 20 years, the rigs themselves haven't. I just use very strong, reliable components that I know won't let me down. And if something isn't working, at least I know it isn't the rig that it's at fault. Yeah. Now, another mistake I see a lot of people doing is not giving much thought to their bite indication um, to a point where it can also compromise presentation um, as well as something we talked about previously and that's stealth. Um, a lot of people may only have one particular bobbin and it may be a heavy bobbin for example and if you're fishing in the margins at short range that, that heavy bobbin is going to lift all the line leading up to the rig off the lake bed 
Um, and if the fish come into contact to that, if they get caught on the fins or if, if it becomes visible, then obviously your, your, your stealth is compromised. The fish are going to be aware that there's something wrong and not, not feed there, not pick up the rig. So in these sort of situations, you want a nice lightweight bobbin uh, where you're able to sink the line and the bobbin won't lift it off the lake bed. So the line leading up to the rig is on the lake bed, out of harm's way and undetectable. Um, now on the other, other sort of side of the scale, we've got fishing at range where I see a lot of people using two lighter bobbins. Um, um, it, it, when fishing at past 60, 70 yard, I think that final final rod length of line at least is going to be on the lake bed just down to gravity um, and if you were to use a lightweight bobbin it's going to take a while for that, that line uh, to move and register the bobbin which will obviously compromise uh, your bite indication the sensitivity of the bite indication so in these situations you want a nice heavy bobbin to make sure as much line as possible is off the lake bed because that last few yards will be on the bottom regardless. That way sensitivity will be increased.